Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. I'm very excited for you today. Uh, Quan Wilcox is with us today, and he is an active duty uh, service member in the U.S. military for our international listeners. And uh, he is the host of Mediocre Dads podcast. Welcome to the show. I'm really happy to have this conversation. Thank you. I'm really appreciate to have me on. Uh, you know, I've I've been a guest on a few shows, and I tell them all the time, like, hey, I'm grateful that you would you responded and even considered to have me on because you know, as a podcast host myself, I understand sometimes getting people on can be very difficult, matching schedules and and all that jazz. So I'm very appreciative and grateful for you to have me on, and I look forward to our conversation and to see where this goes. Excellent. Excellent. And, uh, the feel good fathers really appreciate it. And, uh, thank you for that. Uh, you know, one day, one day we'll maybe, maybe later on, we'll talk about the, the, uh, the systemization and, and the, the procedure of booking guests and, and running a podcast. Oh yes. Oh yes. I think, I think where I'd like to begin, cause we have, we have a handful of big topics is, uh, before we get into your experience of fatherhood and growing up, which I think is really important. Uh, there's a particular element of, your life that is critical that you believe is is really important for fathers and that's some sort of spiritual growth and practice and i'd, I'd love for you to cue that up for feel good fathers i think we'll have a really great conversation here yeah uh so i um i grew up in a christian household and you know it, the moment i became an adult and i say like i say an adult was i left for i left for the army in 2013 basic training and all that jazz and i i left and i was officially on my own able to do my own thing uh i would i very quickly fell into this 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 thing of i don't have to do what i what my parents told me to do where where I didn't have to go to church. I didn't have to read my Bible, if you will, so uh all the time and and be so devout uh a believer, right? Like I was free to think and do what I wanted to do. And so I I kind of took on this 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 mantra of like, hey, I'm a I'm a new man. I can do whatever I want. I'm I'm out here trying to figure it out myself. And so that quickly <laughs> backfired. Uh, and it kind of, I, my life is went through some lives and turns and everything happens for a reason, but, but, you know, uh, one of the biggest, the catalysts that happened to me that kind of led me back to my spiritual faith and why I think spiritual faith is so important is because I, um, in the military, I failed a drug test. And I, and I told this story several times on my own show before, uh, and I failed this drug test and the, it, the reality set in really quickly because, there was a huge, big per, uh, potential for them to kick me out of the military, and and I would essentially be out, and I wouldn't have, you know, a way to feed my kids, um, a way to feed my family, a place to, to. I was paying for two mortgages at the time that I couldn't afford because I could only afford one mortgage, but I was paying for two, uh, and it, so there was a lot of things going on among me getting in trouble. I got in trouble. Uh, they kept me in the army and I went through, uh, and I was in this period where I was just, you know, I, I, it, looking at the mirror, just ashamed of the person that I had become and the same ashamed of what I did and, and truthfully getting caught and all that. But as also I was ashamed because, um, it was a disappointment to my wife and to my, and my kids don't know, really understand what happened, but it was a big disappointment for my wife. And so I tell that story because that is what drove me back to to getting back into God, getting back into uh, making sure that we were going to church uh, every Sunday and really reading the word. And when I did that, the the transformation in my life, the positive transformation that I saw in my life happened. It didn't happen overnight, but it, I would say within six months, I saw myself in a whole different light. There was It was almost like I was a whole new person and that spiritual growth was just prayer through prayer and devoting it did, like I said, devoting myself to reading my, the word every day, it changed. It was, it was small changes that were happening, but then one day it was like, it's like going to the gym, right? You started the gym in the first, the first week, you don't really notice anything, but then six months down the line, you're like, Oh, I have, I have lost, you know, 15 pounds. There is this, there are some lines on my biceps or, you know, I'm seeing some veins, you know, some different things, right? Like you're like seeing this improvement that six months ago, you, you thought was impossible, you know? And so it's the same thing with spiritual growth. If for me, that happened for me and it can happen for anybody was 
there was a change in my life. Those micro changes were happening and now it's a big change. And so for me now, I, one of my biggest messages to anybody, especially to men is to, and to fathers is, Hey, you know, I don't know where you are at with your spirit, within spirit, where your, your spiritual life, but it's so important to me. And it's so, I think it's so, it should important to everybody that, uh, that Jesus did die on the cross for our sins and that, you know, you read, if you read the scripture, you will find so many of these things that how it relates to you, that it hits your spirit and that you're like, wow, I didn't, I didn't know this. I didn't know these things. Right. You know, reading about, uh, <laughs> Moses, right. And how he, you know, he, he parted the sea, right. And he did all these things, he did all these great things, but then you're, you're sitting there and you're like, you didn't realize that Aaron, his brother Aaron was also a big part of how he was able to do those things because Moses didn't feel himself worthy to do all of these things because he wasn't he didn't feel confident in his his able to uh, uh, his ability to speak. Anyway, I could get really deep into the spiritual stuff, but my, the importance of it is, I think that where a lot of men are lacking in a lot of, in a lot of our lives is, is that spiritual aspect. We do focus on our physical aspect. We, we can say, Hey, we go to the gym, we stay fit. Right. And we can say we focus on our mental, our mental aspect where we are, whether we're reading or we're making sure that we're, we're identifying, Hey, my, their emotional intelligence, stress and, and happiness and what that looks like for us. But I think that thing that kind of completes that circle for everybody is that spiritual growth and saying, realizing, Hey, where am I at with that spirit? And who am I that, am I that man that can sit there and lead my, lead my family the way God wants me to lead my family, go down that path in which God has directed me and has in front of me. Um, my biggest thing for anybody is obedience requires action. And so when you, in order, when, you know, when you do feel that calling or God pulling on your, on your heart to say, Hey, this is what I need, what I have planned for you. This is what I would like you to do. Obedience requires action. If Moses wasn't obedient, he would not have been, he wouldn't, he would not have freed the Israelites from Pharaoh under, uh, under Pharaoh's rule in Egypt. One of the uh, one thing I want to point out here that's really critical um, mm-hmm. as a as a as a man of faith myself, Moses tried in the beginning to do it himself, and this yes. is really important for his story. And uh, this is really the book of Exodus, so it's like second mm-hmm. book of the Bible. So uh, it, it it's got some context here. So Moses tries to do it himself, and he ends up murdering a man, and then all of the all the the current Jewish people, all the future the israelites at that time kind of reject him a little Mm -hmm. bit because they're kind of like we're not following you y'all just killed a dude yeah we're gonna be in crazy trouble for what you just did Mm -hmm. and the journey continues and in fact moses does tons of stuff and i think it's i love what you're talking about here because he argues with god he uh god commands him and very patiently i think it's like twice right in the beginning is like no i'm choosing you yep and then Moses is like, nah, man, pick somebody else. And he's like, no, no, you. And he's like, nah, man, again. And the third time you get the stern God voice. Yes. And so the third time God is like, no, this is happening, this whole thing. I love the obedience, the servant, right? Because that all happens through that. And you're right. It is kind of a pattern through there, uh, throughout Exodus and through that journey with Moses and all these other kind of things happening. Uh, I think from... What I love from the fatherhood perspective here, and I want to actually, I have a a separate thought here, but um, Moses leads the people as the father of the nation. So he's sort of the first prophet. He doesn't get to see the fruits of the labor, meaning they are leaving Egypt and going to the promised land, but he dies in the wilderness. He dies on the journey and he never makes it. He never gets to see what Israel is, the promised land from God. As a father, the investment and uh, the thriving and the tools and the conversation and the family culture, you don't always get to see the, the fruits of that labor. And so it requires a faith. It requires, uh, if we look at the standard context that all parents deal with, Typically, if your kid leaves the house at 18, you don't know what happens in their house. Mm -hmm. You don't know what happens in their head. You don't know what's in their heart. You can see acts of character. You can see actions, but Mm -hmm.
but you have to have faith that what you're doing and the best of your capability is going to create the results that you're looking for in your family and in your kids and in your culture. So I think he's a great, a great example here. And thanks for letting me add that context. I think it was yeah. critical for, for feel good fathers. While we're here, I've got my favorite verse right there. What's your favorite verse? Cause I think this is important to understand who you are as a person in, in your journey, man. Ah, uh, okay. So I, I have I have two in my head, but the one I would say that, that the most important one to me is Isaiah 26, 3, keep those in perfect peace who trust in you. And mm-hmm. I have it, I actually have it tattooed on my arm. <laughs> um, uh, and because uh, that verse was my wife. So we were boyfriend and girlfriend at the time when I was in basic training. Uh, and she, we were writing letters cause that's what you had to do in basic training. You didn't have your phones. And I remember her sending me a letter, uh, and I still have this letter, but she sent me this letter. And one of the verses that she, that she put out there, cause I was telling her that I was like, man, you know, mentally, this isn't, this is, this is difficult because I've never been away from home and all these things, different things are happening. I'm growing, but it's like, it's, it's, it's intimidating, you know? And she sent me that verse in the letter where she said, Hey, you know, I think this verse would help you get through it. And so I would tell that, I would say that to, I repeat that verse every morning to myself, keep those in perfect peace who trust me, keep those in perfect peace who trust me and just keep, because all I was searching for was, was peace in mind that I was doing the thing in which I was supposed to be doing or, and that's what that God wanted me to do. And this was when I was 19 years old, you know? Uh, So I was like, okay, keep those in perfect peace. I just want peace to know that I'm doing the right thing. And, then I'm not just doing this thing thinking that like, this is what I'm supposed to do. And I'm actually, I'm supposed to be, you know, completely over here doing this thing. Right. So I would say that verse every day. And so it got to the point we, we got married. I'm in three or four years into the army and I wanted to get a tattoo. And I remember, and all the first, all the first thing that comes to my head when I'm thinking about it, getting a, a tattoo was Isaiah 26, three. And so I, that's why that verse for me is so important because it was the verse in which she said, Hey, I know you're going through a rough time, but this verse right here made me think of you and that this verse, that's what helped me get through basic training, AIT, and then so, and then even Afghanistan and, and so on and so forth. And to the point where I'm at now, I'm over 10 years in the military, got nine years left until I can retire. But that verse has, it's, I always go back to that verse of just to kind of remember like, okay, take a deep breath. I got this. I can do this. Mm. I love it. One of the things that my pastor said to me uh, a while ago, he said, when you're talking about the gospel and talking about the good news, are you communicating that in a way that makes it sound attractive? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and it, it, there, there is, you know, for, for real, there's a branding and marketing component to it, right? There's, there's, yes. there's a whole, the whole piece. Uh, but I think one of the core things that I want to bring up because we, as Christians, we say, yes, Jesus died for our sins. And that's, that's a part of the faith. You it's, uh, it's covered in Romans. And I, I love the way it's articulated in Romans. It's either you believe it or you don't. It's yep. for faith by faith. That's it. So for, for those of you that may not be listening, I, I think what, what's important to understand there is that my personal favorite book is Galatians. Galatians. And, and I guess this is where we're going. This is, this is where we're going today for the conversation. I so like my it. favorite book is Galatians. And the whole the whole purpose of the book of Galatians, uh, and it's beautifully articulated in the letters of Luther on the treaties of the Galatians, is that the price, if you look at the old covenant, the old covenant for cleanliness to be in God's presence, and it's covered a little bit in Exodus and Leviticus, is the sacrifice. So when Adam and Eve sin, they are disobedient to God's word. Um, and they clothe themselves in plant fibers. Uh, God sacrifices an animal from the garden and clothes them in the leather of, of that of that. And the the symbolism of it is that throughout the Old Testament, there is a sacrifice of cleanliness that must be made uh, in very specifically, this is where the term scapegoat comes from. So the scapegoat was uh, established by the Israelites in the desert. And it was the place where Aaron and the priesthood would place all the sins of Israel into the goat. And they would, they would basically banish the goat from the tribe and the goat would leave with the sin 
leave and go to wherever it was going to go, never to be seen by, never to be seen by, by the group. And this is also why we call Jesus the lamb of God, right? It's a, it's, it's, he's the lamb, the sacrifice. So when, when it is articulated that he died for your sin, what's important to understand is that God exists in all time. So, right. The precinct of under, of understanding who God is, he's all powerful, all knowing and all time, right. And ever present eternal. So Jesus is the same. <laughs> so when Jesus died in there, it was for, it, the word is very critical, all sin. So all of humanity said Jesus died for Adam and Eve's sin. And then Jesus died for all future sin. And so what that means is that he was the scapegoat for everyone beyond just the Israelites and into, the, they call it the Gentiles. So if you're not Jewish, you are a Gentile, mm -hmm. which means you're not of the chosen people. Uh, the Jewish were God's chosen people. And therefore, uh, that that's why the sacrifice happened. What does that mean? And why did I bring up Galatians? Because Galatians covers the fact that there's no price for that grace. It's called grace. The forgiveness of sin is called grace in the religious context. There's no price. There's nothing you can do to earn Jesus' sacrifice. The, the only step that you take, and because we talked about obedience, the only step that you take is you, you ask for Jesus to be in your life. And the order, which is very distinct and different from every other religion, every other religion is obedience, save, or it's like it's obedience, ask, save. So that requires a service. It requires what we call a works on the earth to earn your, your salvation. Christianity is distinct and Jesus' sacrifice is distinct because the saving happened already. It's ask, it's ask, save, obey. So the moment you ask for Jesus to be a part of your life and the prayer goes, Jesus, please come into my life. I need you. I love you. I want you to be a part of my life. That's the prayer. You can say it right now if you're listening and you haven't been saved. So um, that's what you ask for. Then you are saved. And then what, what Quan has been talking about is the reading of the Bible and the obedience happens after. There's nothing that you do on the earth that can earn you this salvation. Yes. Yes. Okay. I've, 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 You're good. No, go I, I think it's important because, you know, even even my pastor talked about this on uh, this just this past Sunday, right? Where, you know, people, a lot of Christians or even believers think like, oh, I have to, I have to read the word and then... I can get saved because now I have the the knowledge, if you will, to then know what it is to and what it requires to be a Christian and to be saved. And then I am considered clean, if you will. And then I can now practice and, and show and demonstrate, you know, the armor and wear the armor of God and be that faithful Christian. When when all that that's great. That's part of it, sure. But that's not required of you in order to be saved, right? So yes. I think it's so powerful what you said where Jesus dying on the cross was it. That was the thing that was required. He's already done it and it's internal. It's forever. So for every sin from the beginning to the end, the end being not your life, your life or my life, the end being for when Jesus comes back again for the second coming. And so that it, it's, it's paid for. So all it, all it requires is by saying those words and meaning those words, having, having that, having the heart to mean those words, you know, in the Bible and especially in the Old Testament, it's always talked about kind of real quick tangent here. It's always talked about how God hardened their hearts, right? And he hardened their hearts. He, it didn't mean they didn't believe that God didn't exist. It just means that he hardened their hearts and their hearts were hardened to the point where they're like, they refused to acknowledge his power and his greatness, but they knew he existed and they wanted to do it by themselves. He did it to Pharaoh. That's why those seven, those seven plagues occurred because he hardened his heart. Even though he said, he told Moses, yes, hey, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let the people go worship you so you can go worship God, right? bringing all the way back to Moses. I'm, I'm in Moses right now because I'm in the old, I'm reading, part of my reading is in the old, big, big part of my reading is Old Testament. That's why I'm really big Old Testament stuff right now. But that being said, uh, it's just reading the Bible, reading the word, that's part of it. Prayer's a part of it as well. But again, it's what strengthens your relationship. I tell people all the time, you know, you know, as you mentioned, we, as Christians, we, I think we've done a terrible job at marketing Christianity. And it sounds weird to say that we, we have to market Christianity, but religion and all these things, uh, all these other faces, faith is they're being marketed in a way in which it's attractable to people. Right. You know, well, the gospel, the gospel means 
the command is to spread the good news. Yes, so exactly. That, that is literally marketing. <laughs> and so like you have, so, so like, you know, it, it's not a dirty word or dirty sentence phrase to mar- say market Christianity, right? But we've, I think we've, a lot a, with, as Christians, we've done, we've not done a good job at, at really showing or demonstrating people what it means to be a Christian. You know, for so long, I think there was this idea with Christianity was you had to be perfect. You had to be this this new, you're this new person to be a, considered a Christian, but then you would join a church or whatever the, whatever the case might be. And then other Christians would, would real kill you for like, well, you're not, you're sinning. I've seen you sin. How dare you come claim here to be a Christian? How dare you want to work on the staff and be this person right or after, but you know, you're this person over here, right? You, you're, you're not good enough. Right. And mm. I, what, what we've forgotten is we're all sinners. We're, none of us are perfect. The only perfect person that ever walked this earth had was came and gone. And he's back. He's sitting, seated next to the father right now. So he's came and gone. The rest of us, we're human. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail. But it's on us to take the responsibility, the onus to say, okay, hey, I need to get back into go get back with God and say, hey, God, I've sinned. I failed. But please forgive me. Direct me. Lead me so I can I cannot no longer make this mistake or continue to willingly make this mistake. Because Paul talks about it as well as it's not to say that you're not going to sin again, but to purposely sin and then go back and say, oh, God, forgive me, because even though I purposely sin, is is separate. It's two separate things. So I don't know. It's powerful. I love I love this because my faith was re was reignited and reestablished when when I got in trouble and I really needed I needed God and I needed that 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 guiding because I was trying to do it all by myself. I really was. I was trying to do it by myself. I'm like, oh, I can do it. I got it. It's on me. There's no one else. There's this, this omnipotent being out there that doesn't have, that has my back, if you will. When in reality, he does, he does, and he has, he always has. He's just been waiting for me to come back and acknowledge that, hey, I can't do, I can't do anything without Christ. I can't do anything without God in my life. And that's the way it's, I've been living my life. And it's been, it, it's been great, you know, so. I, I found in, in my prayer practice that, I have, it's, it's weird. I feel a release and a comfort when I pray because I've made a mistake, but when I'm actively working on something and I'm making progress and asking for help or, uh, and this one came to me very recently, I made a prayer and I promised God I would do something. If, if I saw a sign that I saw the sign and I was like, and I went to my wife and I was like, uh, I don't, I don't know if I really want, I still don't feel blah, 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 all these excuses. And, and she was like, you made a vow to God. You need to go do this. <laughs> I was like, I was like, mm, yes, you're correct. I did do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's time to uh, to go honor my word. Uh, uh, the, the the point there was, I, I agree with you. I think that there's a certain level of, it, it, in my experience, I feel a certain way. I would say I feel ten when I pray when I when I know I've made a mistake and I need help. I feel one hundred when I'm actively working and what happens for me is I feel more and more of the presence when I'm making progress and the time between that moment of sin, iniquity, whatever, and moving forward and actively improving my life, I feel more and more of the presence in the voice. And so that's kind of like my personal experience. Uh, and it's a reminder. I, I feel empty when I sin. Mm -hmm. And so that to me is like a a big part of the feel good fatherhood is knowing what's happening. And I'm pantomiming my hand all over my body, like feeling what's happening in my body, feeling what's happening in my emotion in my mind. That's a big part of the feel good fatherhood way. The, uh, that's including what I feel spiritually. And so, uh, there's that piece. And so just for you, I say the Lord's prayer every morning. That's part of, I do Lictio Divine. Uh, that's part of like my, my practice in the morning. Lictio Divine is taking a verse or a prayer and uh, uh, it, uh, and just saying it over and over again and really getting into each word. I learned that from uh, uh, Wayne Dwyer and his getting in the gap meditation. Oh, okay. So he would say the Lord's Prayer in, in one of the meditations and it was you get in, into the gap between the words. So you visualize the word, the first the first word or like the the preceding word, the post, the the post-seating, I don't even know if I'm using the words right, but you get focus on the gap between the words gotcha, and gotcha. it creates, creates a space for God kind of thing. Uh, okay, fantastic. And I think um, just to kind of contextualize this, because I think we, we could, I, I, it's super clear to me that we could talk about this for a, a couple hours. Yes. Um, this faith that for fathers, the faith and the covenant and the promise and the 
love and justice is the Christian's model for fatherhood. Mm -hmm. That the father is just, the father is fair, the father has the rules laid out, the father has the unending love, the acceptance and the grace for his children and the leadership and establishing the rules, right? It, it's important to acknowledge that if you look at just the human things, sure, Moses could have done the tablets from the mountain, but he was he was receiving the dictation of God's word. Sure, whatever, but he was this. Mm -hmm. And like, sure, we think it was Moses that parted the seas. Minor correction. It was God who parted yes. the seas in response to the prayer from Moses. Yes. Right. And, and Moses is such a great figure. I guess we're, I'm coming back to it. Uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to father in a second. <laughs> so Moses does another thing where he tries to do it himself. Mm -hmm. He makes, he doesn't make the prayer, but he breaks the rock and says, I will bring you water yes. in the desert. Mm -hmm. And so it's the second, I, I, there's a couple of times that he does it, but this is another moment. I won't say the second, but it's another moment where he tries to do God's work for him. And takes it on himself. And then God's like, nah, dude, <laughs> I got, I got this. And then he makes the water come mm, from the rock. Mm. And that was his, it was funny so, that his punishment for that was not him not being able to go into the promised land. Him and Aaron's punishment was, Hey, you were no longer, you were no longer to be, be able to walk in or take your people into the promised land. As I, as I promised, it will be someone else. And that was turned into Joshua, but yes, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I, so I think the, 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 there's two core lessons if we're talking about a secular lesson from what, what's happening here. So the first core lesson is what I articulated, which is the love, affection, grace, rules, discipline, fairness that the father brings into the house. And the second piece is that we see an example in Moses and Aaron of them trying to do it without support. And so the huge piece here uh and I, and i know this to be true of active military theoretically you know it on a very personal deep level you all don't do anything by yourself no we do not <laughs> so i i'd love for you to talk about the importance of brotherhood the importance of being surrounded by support and then the family yeah uh you know you you said it you kind of hit the nail on it. we don't do anything by ourselves we there's there are people who like to think that this individualistic thing is you know of of being in the military like I accomplished this this is you know we have tabs on our on our arms and or, you know you got these these uh these badges that you could wear to say hey I've done these I've accomplished these things but in the mid in midst of those accomplishments you weren't alone doing those you weren't alone you had people around you and a lot of them require you to show teamwork or show that you're capable of working within a team, whether you're a leader in that team, it's time for you to lead and you can lead that team effectively, or you're required to take a step back and be a follower and say, Hey, okay, someone else is in charge. Now I need to, I need to be able to take commands, take direction and figure out what it is we, so we can accomplish this mission. So we all see success because once we all see success, we, in our own ways, we've individually seen our own success, but yeah, you can, you're never doing anything alone. You're, you're, there's always this teamwork. And so even in basic training there, they, they make you go through these things, these these things that seem kind of like, oh, this is just a physical aspect of that we must do. Like the, um, we have to do a, uh, oh my gosh, what is it called? Uh, an obstacle course. I'm sorry. We have to do an obstacle course. And, you know, you're separated into these teams and the, how they separate them is they'll, they'll separate you into kind of physical ability, mental ability, and, and different things, right? They'll kind of look at you and say, okay, based off of what I've known about these individuals, Physically, they're great. Mentally, they they're not they're not they don't work good on their toes. But this person lacks what he lacks for, or he or she lacks physically. They make up for mental aspects, and so they build the teams that way. And then you're doing this obstacle course, right? And as you're going through this obstacle course, it's fun, right? You're yelling, you got the drill sergeants yelling and screaming at you, and you got your 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 teammates or your battle buddies yelling, "Hey, we got this! Let's go! We're going! All, we're doing all doing all these things." And then by the time you get to the end of this. You're like, man, you don't, you know, it no longer was in the beginning where you're sitting there like, oh, how am I going to do this? Like, I'm, I'm not sure if I can climb that, that, that tall wall or climb that rope. It was in the end of it, you're sitting there like, we did it. We accomplished something. And there was that, it was a small mental shift of working with somebody 
that you've never that you never imagined you would probably ever work with uh, on a normal basis, but you've worked with them and you saw their strengths, but you also saw their weaknesses and they saw your strength and they saw your weaknesses, but you guys were able to compliment each other and say, hey, how can we get through this? What can I do to help you in, with some of your weaknesses? And what can you do to help me and my weaknesses? But at the end of the day, what can we do to get through this as a team? And so you learn that in the early on in the, in the military through all these things that you do, right? You, it, it's, it's about building a cohesion and working as a team and building a brotherhood, if you will, of, of working with people. And so now, as when you, when you get to your first duty station, you're there doing everything, you realize very quickly I'm not alone in this. I'm not alone. I need. I have people on the left, right of me, and uh, you know, seniors, superiors who who have who have my back and want to help me, whatever the case might be. And so for me, and that translates to the to to my family is is we have this. We have uh, these different words, if you will, characteristics, and we're supposed to demonstrate at all times. One of them is loyalty. And so for my daughters, I always I tell my oldest, especially, I say, "Hey, your sister." is 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 more than your best friend i was like there is nothing in this world that can separate you two meaning no man woman person other person can separate you or turn you against your sister you and your sister are a team no matter what if you guys have an issue you talk about it here in the house if they're but out there to the world you guys are a team there's nothing that no one can come in in between you and say your sister said this your sister did this it's on you and your sister if someone ever does do that you say that doesn't sound like my sister uh and if you have an issue with my sister i suggest you talk to my sister but as for me and mine, we, I'm sorry, I'm going to get switched. But anyway, well, I was going to go there. But, you know, me and my sister, we're not, we're, you know, that whatever you're saying, that might, that, that's nice. But I don't, I don't have time or nor do I want to hear what you have to say. And then when you come home, hey, such and such was bringing this to my attention. If this is true, we need to address it. If not, how are we going to address it? You know, but it's little things. Obviously, that's a big conversation for a six-year-old. But still, it's little things by just saying, "Hey, you, you and your sister." I was like, "You have to take care of your sister. You're responsible for your sister to take care of your sister." And it's like when you have brothers, you're responsible for them because you're the big sister. I said it's a big responsibility to be the oldest child. And so, learn. That's what I learned from the military is having that loyalty to one another, regardless of if you guys agree or disagree, get angry at each other, or whatever the case might be. At the end of the day, you always have each other's back. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So I like even yeah. in even so like there are people that I work with that I don't like. <laughs> I don't like, and they don't like me, or people don't like me. Not everybody's going to like each other, but we wear the same uniform, and I could tell you right now, if. For whatever reason, you found we found each other. We we were all out a bar, right, having a good time. I'll, I'll use this as an example, but we were out in a bar, and some guy or a group of guys try to pick a fight with this guy that I don't like. That individual can count on me to step in and say, "Hey, I don't know what you think you're about to do, but I promise you, it's not going to go the way you think it is." Right? That individual, me and him, may not like each other at work, but outside of he, outside of work, outside of that the the office setting. We have each other's back regardless. He knows it, and I know I know it. And it's crazy because we can go right back into work and be like, hey, bro, don't even talk to me. I don't even, I ain't nothing to do with that, right? But, like, in that moment, we could sit there and say to each other, like, man, these dudes are, like, best friends. And it's crazy. But And I try right. to build that for my daughters and try to do that with my family. It's like, hey, the family, our family needs to be strong. We need to, we always need to have each other's backs. We need to have, and what that requires is conversation and communication between each other to know when we step out of here that there's not, there's not going to be an entity out there that's going to tear us apart. I, I absolutely love that because as a model for the house, I think that's fantastic that no matter what happens, it's super critical that in the moment that you're supportive and you, you take that leadership role of supporting no matter what. If there's a correction that needs to happen, you do that in private. Mm -hmm. That's also a model for a professional world, right? You correct in private, you don't do it publicly. You don't, it's called corporal punishment. You don't discipline the group for the activities of one or two, right? Because it creates ambiguity. It creates uh, an unsure footing. It doesn't let your top performers know. It doesn't let your bottom, like, and your bottom performers aren't paying attention anyways. Mm -hmm. So it's true. <laughs> uh, but that it's a united front and, um, uh, are you an older, are you an older sibling as well? Excuse me. I am. So uh, 
I yeah. um yeah. So for me, I, I mentioned to you, I was adopted, right? So me and my twin brother, I'm the older sibling. Now, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I didn't find that out until I was uh, 16, 17 years old. So our entire life, we thought he was older because he was bigger, slightly taller. So it was kind of like, uh, it was kind of obvious stated like, oh, well, he's the older, he's the older of the two. Um, you know, uh, my birth mom found us on Facebook to reach out to my mom and have a conversation, started having a conversation with us. She made a post one day. She's like, hey, you know, basically shout out to my oldest son and, you know, blase, blase. And I looked at the picture and I go, that's me. <laughs> and I look at my brother and I go, I, re- I remember showing him, I go, I go, yo, that's me right there. He goes, yeah, so? I'm like, she says I'm the oldest. And he goes, "What? wait, hold on, hold on. And so like not believing it, we message her and, she's, and we're like, hey, who's older? Like, you know, kind of like it seems a strange question to ask, right? And like, what do you mean who's older? And she's like, well, you know, Quan is older. And I go, and I look at him and I said, in your face. I was like, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm my brother's keeper. Go ahead. You know, you know what, you know what? Yeah. And so I'm older um, in our own way. He doesn't recognize it. I, I'll call him just to mess with him. And I'll be like, hey, little bro, what you doing? And he'll be like, yeah, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. <laughs> but we're identical awesome. twins. It was a, it was a C-section. I just, I was just pulled out first, you know, either. So like it, it that's, sure. that's, how, that's all how it is. I'm older. Our birth certificate could say the same time, 630. But it's the little things in life in which I get over him to say, hey, you're my little brother. You're going to act correctly when you're talking to me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. 630 in one second versus 630 in, exactly. in, in you know, 47 mm-hmm. seconds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. They, there was yeah. time. They were focused you. on me. And they're like, oh, yeah, there's another one. Hold on. Let's grab them. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, you know, I, I am the older, uh, older of the two. And even even when we were growing up and I not nec- I didn't necessarily know that I was the older one I would I I still try to take on this thing with my brother where I was like hey man I was like we have to do a, we have to have a united front uh and I think because we weren't really it wasn't really instilled in us to have that that united front into to what understanding what brotherhood looks like um we 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 aired out our business to the other people we were like we would we would talk behind each other's back. We would, you know, would do all these things. And, and I recognize how over time it kind of, it, it, it put a strain on our relationship. Me and my brother now we're great. And me and him, I can call him and I'll tell him I can be very blunt and very frank with him. And he can do the same thing to me. He might get upset. I might get upset. And we might say like, all right, bro. All right, whatever. Hang up the phone. But then within a way, within a day, a week, whatever, we can call each other back and say, Hey, and talk, talk about it or just, you not even bring it up as if it didn't happen. And so for my daughters, I never want that split or that, that strain to happen. And so I think it's so important to teach my, especially my oldest daughter, like, Hey, it's, it's a big, big role to be the, the older sibling. You know, it's, it's, it means a lot in, you know, I know I put a lot on your shoulders and it's not to, to stress you out or to, to weigh you down, but it's to, to, for you to recognize that when you get older, when you are an adult, there are going to be times where, you as older sibling have, you know, are going to be seen as, as this, this, this leader figure, if you will. And people are going to base what, what your, what you do or the, what your siblings do based off of you and say, Hey, well, you know, Nevea didn't do that. So did, uh, so why are the, why are her siblings doing that? Nevea didn't act this Mm -hmm. way. So why are her siblings acting this way? Right. Always bringing it back to what did the older sibling do? What example did the older sibling set in order to show them? It's not the older siblings that's the parent. It's just most of the time as kids get older, they're going they're that that fascination with the parents is gonna shift from mom and from dad to mom, back to dad, back to then to their older sibling, because their older siblings kind of out there in the world and having their own experiences. Yeah. I love that. Uh what uh what is the importance of your intention of fatherhood? So there was there was a story here. We we briefly discussed it off air. Uh, what tell me about, tell us about this? Uh, so I uh, it's kind of big. It kind of goes back to why I started mediocre dads. But um, I, as I mentioned, I was adopted, uh, and uh, me and my twin brother were adopted when we were two years old, and we grew up, and you know we it was by a white family. So culturally we, we had, our life was different. 
from the typical, um, or I won't say typical, I'll say stereotypical black, uh, what black people, black, what it's like growing up in a black family. So there were a lot of things, minor things that we didn't know that we weren't accepted. Um, but you know, I remember when I was young and I would get in trouble, I would cry and I would be like, I want my parents, I want my parents talking about my mom because that bond was still there when I was fairly young. And, um, I would wish for every Christmas that like, oh, my birth mom's going to appear and then we're just going to go live with her. And, and I now have an understanding of who I am and who my brother is, why we do what we do. We, we, we have someone who we, our mannerisms are the same. Everything about us is the same, right? Uh, they never happened. And so fast forward, uh, you know, we grew up, we live our lives and we're, we're, we, we have this family and my, my adoptive family is my family. My pa- adoptive parents are my parents. Um, but I made this, I made a vow, if you will, to myself that when I become a dad, I'm going to be the best dad that I can be. Like, cause I, I think it's, I, I just hated, truthfully hated the fact that my, my, there was these two people who had us and, you know, whatever the situation was that led to this having to be adopted, but they never came and found us. They never came and got us, never came and wanted to see us. And that, that really hurt me and, and irritated me because I, I, I was thinking to myself, how could you not want, you know, how could you sit there and have these, have kids, have human, be, have birth, give birth to these kids and never want to see them or find them or, and, and see how they're doing and where they're at in life. You know, like, why would you, I, I just, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't, fa- you know, just never fathom that. So I made this commit when I was 17 years old. I said, when I become a dad, I'm going to give my kids the best life that I possibly can. And they're going to know and be able to know why they are what they are. I mean, like the little things in life. Why do I, why do I talk too much? Oh, cause my dad talks too much. <laughs> you know, why do I have this scar on my hand? And I, I really do have the scar on my hand. I don't know if you can see it, but I have the scar on my hand, right? It's like, why, where did this come from? What happened? I don't, I don't know what the scar is. I can't tell you what it's from, but why do I have this? What is, you know, these little things in life, these little questions, these questions that you're growing up as a kid saying like, I have parents, but they're not, they're not the ones who give birth to me. They don't, they don't know why I have a scar on my hand unless they were there when I got the scar, but they did, they weren't, you know, do they know why do I, seem to talk too much do they know why this about me you know and so anyway i it, it led to me to when i when i was like i said when i became a dad that my kids were never going to be able never going to have to question that they're always going to be able to sit there and say my mom and dad have the answers because they're my mom and dad and you know i appreciate and respect anybody who wants the willingness to adopt people adopt kids young kids um you know, and it's nothing against adopting. It's just, you know, I wish and I hope, right, that if you have the opportunity to be with your parents, the ones who gave birth to you, you know, it's be, I hope that your parents love and can be there because as you see your kids grow and, and, and I smile because it just makes me think of, as, of my daughter when she was young, because her birthday's coming up here in two weeks. So from when she was two years old, to now going on six and I'm just like, Oh my gosh, this girl's freaking tall. Now she has her own personality. She, she has attitude. She has spunk because you know, she's, she's, you know, she's my daughter. And so like, you know, like she has all these different things, these things about her. And, you know, I'm, I have to see that growth. It just makes me so happy that I was, I'm able to be there and see it happen and see it occur. And, uh, and so, you know, that's, it led to me starting mediocre dads podcast because I wanted to, express one to be able to express that but then also it holds me accountable meaning the things i say certain i'll say certain things on on the podcast or if i'm on someone else's podcast and i'll go back and i'll think i'll be like hmm it's easy for me to say this thing but am i living my life am i doing the thing that i'm saying and if i'm not immediately requires correction and fix it and say okay how do i do that and if i am then i'm i'm comfortable i'm like yep i put this thing out you know i'm talking about this thing I, I'm telling other people to do it and I'm doing myself great. So that's one of my big things that holds me accountable to know like, Hey, it's not just mediocre dads. It's just not just me sitting here trying to put sweet listenings in people's ear to set, to sound good, to get a, to be a platform, right? It's an, uh, it's an me actually living how I'm living my life and what I'm doing with my kids to, to help develop and grow them to become successful adults. Absolutely. Love it. Uh, Quan Wilcox. Thanks for so much for coming Appreciate out. you.